All right. Well, this interview has been a long time coming. Our next guest is an absolute no-holds-barred legend. You know him from his epic fights in the early days of the UFC, his run with WCW, and classic matchups all over the world. He now joins us for the first time on Submission Radio. Tank Abbott, we're beyond Hello. excited to welcome you to the program. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, hello, everybody. The pleasure and honor is all allows. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, there's a lot of fun uh -huh. things, a lot of fun things to talk about. But of course, first things first, the most important thing, um, obviously your health. We know we've, you've experienced some health issues not too long ago, but we see on social media that you're, you're bouncing back from a very serious transplant surgery. Uh, for the fans that are out of the loop, what was the surgery and how are you feeling at the moment, Tank? Oh, I had uh, quite a few of surgeries, but uh, yeah. the big kahuna was uh, my liver. Mm -hmm. I was burning the candle at both ends for a long time and it finally caught up to me. So uh, my liver gave out. I got a new liver and a new uh, kidney. So here I am in living color. <laughs> well, uh, you look great. How, how, how are you feeling? Because we saw you were back in the gym. You were doing your thing again. How does uh -huh. it feel to be on the mend and have that new liver? I imagine that um, you'd be back into the bar in no time testing it out. Uh, I don't drink anymore. I learned my lesson. I don't need to put my hand, I don't need to put my hand on the stove twice. But uh, yeah, I uh, I feel like a new person. I feel better than I did when I was feeling better when I was my own self, healthy. So it's uh, I guess a godsend. But things happen for a reason, and uh, I'm honoring the donor that uh, donated his kidney and uh, um, taking good care of it. Awesome. Well, that's 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 the best thing to know. Um, so obviously we've got a whole bunch of fun things that we want to talk to you about regarding MMA, given that you're a legend of the sport. Um, do you? I'm wondering though, do you still keep in touch with MMA? Do you still watch the product? Any fighters that sort of stand out on your radar? Um, yes, I do. Uh, I don't want to uh, forget. I also got a kidney, and I want to also uh, say that uh, they're awesome too for. Uh, donating the kidney the donors of the world thank god anyways that's out of the way uh, mma uh yeah i'm in the gym i actually just got back from the gym and uh there's a few fighters that i like out there uh chet congo and rampage train in the same rampage jackson they say uh train in the same gym as i do mm -hmm. and yeah. uh it's uh, good to, to watch them fight and be around them. And I've got to be friendly with both of those guys. And, uh, you know, I was just at the Czech Congo fight in San Jose a couple of weeks back and uh, it's got stopped by uh, a thumb in the eye. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, who knows if it was intentional or not, but it was a no contest. Uh, There's a little skirmish after the fact and... Uh, I was trying to make my way into the cage, but um, I couldn't get over the railing. So really, you were actually trying to get in there. Oh hell yeah, I was gonna uh, throw down with Rampage and Chet, um, but uh, the barrier seemed uh, to be uh, too significant for me to get over at the time, and uh, I was kind of freaking my wife out. So I calmed down, <laughs> but I was definitely on my way. Other than that. Uh, you know, I really don't uh, have any uh, dog in the race with anybody. I like to watch a good fight and uh, see what happens. Mm. That was uh, that was Ryan Bader that uh, got away very, very easily with you not not jumping into that um, cage at Bellator. Were you going to go have a couple of words with Ryan Bader after what happened at the end of that Chick Congo fight? Uh, I was just going to show him what a real thumb lock looks, looks like. <laughs> one's the ones you kind of deliver on the street, you know what I mean? Mm. But, uh, and, uh, but, uh, things, uh, were in my way. I couldn't get over. So things happened for a reason once again. So mm. he lucked out. <laughs> I'm just wondering when it comes to, uh, Ryan Bader, Scott Coker said that he's like one of the greatest heavyweights, um, in the game today. What, what do you think of that notion of Ryan being one of the best heavyweights? Well, you know, uh, I wrestled 190 pounds in, in junior college, and that was my wrestling weight. So, you know, I like uh, the smaller big guys because, you know, if you're as strong as I am, you can throw around the big guys. And I don't know how strong Bader is, but uh, 
he seems to be like a 190 pounder kind of guy wrestling wise. So, you know, when you're, when you're going up in weight, it's kind of different. I was cutting down from 230. And so I was a bigger guy going down to a smaller weight. But when you're small trying to go up, it's hard to uh, sit, there, sit there and take uh, check, checks, kicks. I'm sure they would have hurt him. But uh, as far as really knowing about Bader, I have no idea his, <laughs> his skill level. I wanted to ask you about a guy that you would obviously be a lot more familiar with, Tank, uh, and that's Tito uh-huh. Ortiz because he's sort of, you know, a guy that's from a similar era to you. What do you think about him sort of still being in the game and still fighting on? came out of retirement not too long ago, and now he's fighting uh, Alberto Del Rio for C- Combate Next. Uh, I, I am uh, very well ac- acquainted with uh, Tito Ortiz. Yep. Uh, in my opinion, you know, I can go on for hours about him. But he is uh, a liar, a cheat, and a scumbag, uh, and uh, a con man. He's conned the whole world into really making people think that he's a fighter. Uh, I was there at his first fight. He fought as an alternate on one of my shows. And before he went into the fight, he was crying like a little baby. I don't want to do this. (laughs) And one of my training partners slapped him across the face and said, Quit being a baby. You're going to go in there and just do a wrestling thing. Go in there and take him down and hold on. And that's, he listened too well because that's all Tito does is, as he goes out there, takes you down and, and does anything. He's not really a person that has a warrior set of mind. He's like I said, he's a con man, a liar and a thief. And uh, so as far as him being tough, and he can act like he's tough, but he's the last guy you want on your side when uh, things hit the fan. We want to quickly touch on uh, one of the biggest names in the spot, Conor McGregor, with your tank. He's been in some hot water for throwing a dolly at a bus, breaking a fan's phone. Most recently, he punched an older gentleman in the face at a bar. But on the flip side, he sold millions of pay-per-views and no doubt was one of the reasons the sport made it on a platform like ESPN. What are your thoughts on Conor McGregor sort of being this uh, big star in the sport? Well, I don't, I don't think it's a big secret, but uh, I'm not really into the lawn jockeys of the world fighting. Um, you know, I don't really think that, you know, when I fought, it was like, who were the toughest guys around? And they got in there and fought. But you didn't need to bring a hide behind a weight class or anything like that. And so Connor, you know, actually uh, Floyd Mayweather kind of actually put him on the map. But, uh, yeah, he's done his thing. He's made his money. Uh, You know, I I didn't really have a thought about him or uh, an opinion. But, you know, I I did see the punch that he did to the poor old guy, and I, I wasn't on board with that. Um, all the other stuff, all his shenanigans is, uh, whatever, you know, who cares? Boys being boys, but to actually, and it was, it was basically a sucker punch in my eyes to that old poor guy. I mean, what are you doing when that goes down? So I could tell you just from an outsider looking in, he's not somebody that I would be a fan of. How do you think a, a guy like Conor McGregor would have done in the early days of the UFC on some of the cards that you were a part of? I think he would probably have fell down on the ramp getting into the cage. Um, there's a reason why there's weight classes, and that's because you can hide behind them. I mean, the first guy I fought was over 400 pounds, and then I fought a guy that was 380 pounds. Either one of those guys would have stepped on McGregor and squashed him like a bug. I was going to say, are you, are you a fan? Because, uh, you know, I feel like you're a man who likes fighters, fighters. And I'm, I'm not in any way saying that Connor isn't that guy. But we've got, obviously, Nate Diaz fighting Jorge Masvidal for the baddest motherfucker on the planet, Belt. Are you a fan of this matchup? And obviously, this Belt kind of, you know, being being thrown into the mix. Uh, well, I think it's pretty funny, actually. I mean, neither one of those guys would qualify as a bad guy in my eyes. I mean... 
I, I could throw it out there. I'll transplants and all. I'll fight the winner of that fight. <laughs> why, 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 why don't why don't either of those guys sort of rank as uh, badasses in in your book tank? Well, obviously their size and uh, their uh, the whole makeup of it. Like I said, it's just not something that you know even comes close to being something that I would be interested in. I definitely would not think either one of those guys are the baddest whatever in the world are far from it. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering what you sort of think of them uh, skill-wise, you know, given for their size. And also, in, in your mind, who do you reckon is sort of the baddest man in the planet? Mm, I don't even know, other than myself, but... Uh, That's a given, yeah. Like, yeah, but uh, other than that... Uh, to be honest with you, I don't, you know, I like Fedor. I still do. I like Fedor. He's a pretty tough man. Uh, I like, you know, just it doesn't really matter as far as um, your skill level or whatever. It's, it's what you have wrapped up in your head that makes you tough. And uh, Fedor is tough. Um, other than that, you know, the jury's still out. I don't have any opinions on anybody else. So the challengers add their tank. Whoever becomes the BMF uh, champion, you, you'd, you'd be happy to take them on. <laughs> yeah, I, I said that about uh, Ronda Rousey. That's probably how I think of it. You, you, you because you, I remember going, Dennis. Well, I was going to say with the Ronda Rousey thing, I believe there was a, a bit of a wager. If uh, if you beat Ronda Rousey, she goes and makes you a sandwich, and if she beats you, you give her a hundred grand. What would be the wager? For the per, for the BMF champion, if they were to fight you, uh, well, who was the guys fighting for that? So you got Nate uh, Nate Diaz, and you've got oh. Jorge Masvidal. Oh, they can make me a burrito. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, I, I was gonna say just on on Ronda, what do you think about the success that she's having in the WWE? You know, after oh, sort of finishing her was, MMA career. You know, I'm I'm happy for her. you know uh, once she got over and she made her dough and. I don't necessarily think when you make that kind of money is it's not about making the money. It's more about the passion. So if she lived her passion and she got over and she made her dough, good for her. I know you're a guy that obviously had a lot of success in the pro wrestling industry. Did you sort of get more respect for her because she went into the WWE and was able to actually get through the training, actually have a successful run? And actually put on some decent matches. I mean, it takes it takes a lot of toughness to do something like oh, that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, professional wrestling is a lot harder than uh, people give it credit for. And uh, she uh, obviously uh, went through the uh, ropes and did her thing. And uh, so I have uh, utmost respect for her. Even though joke around and say she can make me a sandwich and that kind of stuff. But I do have respect for her. Mm. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, a time in WCW 1999. We know you were a big part of that era. You had some great programs yes. there with a bunch of big guys. I'm just wondering, while we're talking about the BMF title, who do you think was the, some of the toughest guys in the in the locker room back in 1999 when you were a part of WCW? Oh, wow. That's a, I've never been asked that question. All those guys are tough in their own way. And... Uh, it's interesting. Um, like I said, they're all different walks of life and everybody was really cool and respectful. And it was, uh, likewise, it was a two way street. So there, yeah, there was a, a lot of tough guys in there and, uh, I met them all. They were all cool. Mm. If, if you had to sort of pick two or three guys that would be by your side, if something went down at one of the bars at Huntington beach, who were a couple of names from the locker room you would have picked? <laughs> wow, I'm a I'm a solo warrior on that one. I don't I don't need anybody to be on my side. I whoever wanted to be next to me, I'm next to them. Any it, what what would you say? <clears throat> excuse me. What would you say is one of the craziest uh, bar stories that you can think of that comes to mind when it comes to Huntington Beach and some of the times there? No, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, there's so many stories. It's uh, not one I could pick out of. You know, I, I wrote a novel, and um, it's kind of about beach living and uh, 
what went down. It's called uh, Before There Were Rules. Mm. And it's, it was over a thousand pages long. And uh, it's got three books to it. It's a trilogy to complete the whole book. But uh, it uh, kind of goes over a lot of stories like that. It, like I said, it's a novel, so it's made up. But you can uh, understand what kind of went down back in those days. Yeah, no, it's a great book, actually. And I think a lot of people should check it out. A lot of fantastic stories. It's a novel, but uh, I believe there's a lot of stuff there that was based on some of the stories in your life. I'm just wondering, just going back to WCW, I mean, you mentioned that everybody was so respectful there, but a life of a wrestler is a life on the road. And I, I believe you guys would have had some interesting moments going from bar to bar and city to city. Are there any stories that sort of stick out to you during your, your run with WCW? Any crazy stories in any bars or any sort of funny road stories that stand out to you? Well, you know, living a professional lifestyle, professional wrestling lifestyle is kind of like uh, living a rock star style mm. lifestyle. But, uh, you know, after my liver transplant, I said there's a, a joke out there. You know, most people say, yeah, I party like a rock star. Well, rock stars uh, say they partied like me. Uh, like think, <laughs> but uh, I was fortunate enough to get a, a liver transplant and be uh, still alive. But yeah, that whole scene was just one party after another, and to pick out just one episode would be really hard to do. Mm. Well, I'm wondering because we know there's a lot of ribbers in the back. Did anybody mess with Tank Abbott when you were there, or they knew they probably knew your history well before you stepped in that locker room? Yeah, no one really ribbed me face to face, but uh, I could hear people whispering uh, behind my shoulder, I'm sure. What What was it? What, what were you hearing? <laughs> oh, well, nothing specific, but, you know, everybody has to put down everybody at some point in time. It's just fun ribs, nothing personally serious or anything. Mm. I remember you had, you had that uh, segment with Rick Steiner where you were sort of standing uh, ringside, and then he came out, and you two s sort of had a bit of a pull apart. What was your relationship like with the Steiner brothers? We remember that they could have been, they were pretty merciless when it comes to ribbing certain people, and people yes. really respected those guys in the back. What was your relationship like with them? Yes, uh, we both, both those brothers, uh, I had gotten along well with them. They're both cool guys, and uh, very respectful, and I was very respectful of them. And uh, yeah, they they uh, they were uh, rivers for sure, but all in fun. Is there any is there any Steiner story that sticks out to you during your time with WCW? Uh, not really. I mean, you can't just really pinpoint something. It was was an interesting uh, thing to witness. There was rumors that they didn't get along and, you know, but who knows? They work together, so. Mm. Well, let me ask you about uh, Bill Goldberg, because obviously you had that match with Bill. Uh, it was uh -huh. sort of at the peak of his popularity. And, I mean, he's had this uh, return to the WWE now. But let me just ask you quickly, during that time, what was it like working with Bill Goldberg? Especially because his whole gimmick was based on sort of being an MMA fighter and sort of being legitimately tough and all this kind of stuff. He'd come out with the MMA gloves. Sure. Um, what was it like actually being, a, you know, a legitimate MMA accomplished uh, fighter and get going in there with a guy like Goldberg? What was your relationship yeah. like with him? What was it like actually doing the match with him? Bill uh, is actually a really uh, cool guy. He's nice. And uh, there was never any, he was very respectful. There was no ever any heat. And uh, he is, uh, he's tough in his own right. He's a tough man. Uh, but, uh, you know, he was, he was doing his thing, and uh, I was along for the ride at that point in time in my life. So he was calling the shots, and I just went along with him. It's fascinating that you mention that because obviously Bill's made this return to the WWE now. A lot of people are critical of Bill. You know, there were some mishaps in a couple of matches. Uh, some people say that he shouldn't be having the position that he has with the WWE. What are your thoughts on this sort of second run that he's having with the company at this point in his career? You know, I, I haven't followed it that much, 
but you know, Bills got his way in to the uh, being at the top of the heap, and so uh, you know he deserves to be around if he's putting asses in the seats. So that's all that matters, I guess. I'm wondering, you know, <clears throat> MMA and, and uh, well, sorry, no holds barred and sort of pro wrestling. It's like it's two similar but very different uh, industries. What was the, what was the more fun time for you, Tank? When did you sort of enjoy it, and what was the better part of your life? Uh, by far, uh, wrestling was a great time, and uh, fighting is a, is a whole different scene. It's more serious and to the point where wrestling is athletic by, you know, they're the best athletes in the world as uh, heard from uh, Hulk Hogan say, stating that. But uh, as far as um, when you're in a fight, it's all serious, serious, serious. When you're doing wrestling, it's serious, but it's more intellectual. It's more fun that way. You, you know, there's psychology behind things and you get to tinker around with that kind of stuff. So, that makes it funner in a way, but mm. they're, they're apples and oranges. I'm wondering, Tank, obviously you had so many great matchups in your No Holds Barred and sort of uh -huh. UFC and MMA career. How much training did you do? I mean, we remember seeing a video of you sort of benching 600 pounds, but when it came to actual fight training, how, how often were you in the gym? How much did you oh. train leading into a fight? Oh, absolutely. Um, like I said, I just got back from the gym and, uh, I used to work out all day, at least eight hours a day. And then I would, wow. and then I usually start training three months before a fight. But as soon as that fight was over, I was the first one in the bar <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like to have a good time. I'm known for having a good time. So that's what I was all about. Um, but yes, I definitely did train. I mean, I started wrestling when I was nine years old, amateur wrestling. And uh, I've always been an athlete of some sort. And just the notion of me fighting in bars, I, I have been in a lot of bar fights. Uh, but um, as far as that being part of my training, that was the furthest thing from it. I was lifting weights, running, training, wrestling, boxing, the whole nine yards. But you have to remember, when I started fighting, there was no... Uh, there was no place to go. You know, there was no well, five shows had been completed by the time I fought in UFC six. There was just jujitsu gyms. There was not really they were just in their infancy. But most of the time I was in a wrestling room or a boxing gym. And then, you know, what fun is that if you're training, if you can't go out in the street and get drunk and beat somebody up? So at that point in time, you know, I'm not saying that I coined MMA, but I used to get questioned all the time, like, oh, what is your martial arts? How do you train? I would go, well, I kind of take a little bit from everything. It's all mixed up into one. You, you, wrestling is my base and then boxing is my base for striking. And then I mix everything in jujitsu, uh, karate things, the things that work, not the things that are like gimmick things. Thing. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, somebody coined the mixed martial arts and then now it's MMA. So mm -hmm. I'm all, it's like the gloves. I'm the one that brought the gloves to the, the UFC. Um, they laughed at me when I brought them there, but uh, I know one thing I didn't have hurt hands. Actually, I did I bruised my left hand after the first show, but I probably would have had a broken hand if I didn't have those gloves on. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Tank, we, we, we appreciate the time. We've got one more question. We'll let you go because uh -huh. we know you're a busy guy. Um, obviously, MMA is so different to No Holds Barred now. I just want to know, what are your thoughts on the UFC now, Dana White, and a lot of fans sort of want to see you get inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame. Is that something that would that would be a big deal to you, something that would mean a lot? Uh, I don't not It's not on the top of my list. You know, it's all political motivated, and I don't have uh, anything that I want from anybody. So when it turns political, you want to give it to me, fine. I, 
I'm sure I'm more qualified than the clowns that are in it now. But uh, you know, Dana White, I don't, I don't need or want anything from that man. He's, he's just made a a, a whole thing of of he's made a character out of himself because he's he's not a fighter he's not anything else so might as well mug on the camera all these guys just want to be famous i don't it's never been my cup of tea but i guess there's a need for to be famous so dana used his uh boxer size training uh partners the fertita brothers the billionaire boys to uh use their money and create a role for himself. But that's for people that care to be something. So Dana White, Dana White wants to put me into the UFC. I'm not going to kiss his ass to get there. Uh, you can just put me there on my merits. I put, I, you know, I put more people watching that show than I, I dare say anybody else. And then, uh, so... As far as the UFC Hall of Fame, whatever, like I said, it's political and I don't care about it because I don't need anything from anyone. I can do well on my own. Mm. Well, we can definitely see that. And the most important thing, Tank, is the fact that you obviously your health is good. You're back in the gym, you're training. You're still obviously in the MMA game, in the MMA industry, like you mentioned, Rampage and Czech Congo, and you're sort of doing your own thing. So it's good to see you healthy. Follow the man on Twitter, at TankPod, and of course on Instagram, Tank.Abbott. A true honor and pleasure chatting to you, Tank. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for chatting with us. Um, It's been my pleasure. You guys down in Australia, are you? Yeah, yeah, in Melbourne, where UFC 243 is happening next week for the big fight. Yeah. Oh, I, I skipped that uh, part of town. I was down there in 1985 mm-hmm. for the America's Cup on in Perth. Oh, yeah. And then, and then we went over to Sydney and up to Brisbane and raised a bunch of hell down there. <laughs> <laughs> you're, over, yes. you're overdue to raise some hell in Melbourne, man. So come down and uh, we'll raise some oh. hell with you or at least watch. Well, yeah, well I, those are my retired days, huh? Now my wife's saying she'll do it with you guys. So. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah. Uh, all right, you guys take it easy. Thanks, Hank. Thank Bye. you so much, Tank. All the best. All right. Take care. All Bye. right.